Hey, welcome back to Talk Gnosis, and welcome back to Michael Osborne. Hello, Michael. Hi, hi. How are you, John? I, I'm, I'm really awesome. I'm, I'm going to uh, miss seeing you every Friday. Uh, behind the scenes, you know, I'm going to be releasing these shows uh, in uh, not all back to back. For some, some of the audience will know that I'm uh, at this point. I'm having a child. By the time you watch this, I will have had a child. So I'm doing some pre-taping in advance. But uh, that said, I've really uh, enjoyed my, my discussions with Michael, and I know I'm really going to enjoy our discussion today, and you are too, because he's translated a, a really important, fascinating, you know, may, maybe book isn't quite, the, well, his book is a book, but, uh, but a collection of documents from the from the 18th century uh, with some, some very fascinating mystics who had some very penetrating, fascinating experiences and insights into humanity, reality, God, society, just about everything. So uh, let's just get into it. Uh, Michael, the, the name of your book is The Lessons of Lyon. Like, what are the lessons of Lyon and what motivated you to release the first ever English translation to the public? Okay, um, taking those questions in reverse, <laughs> um, what you were saying just now in your preamble about them being um, these documents being written by mystics and and, and men of, of, of great wisdom um, who purport to have a very close relationship with God and have been developed spiritually and so on and so forth, that's what attracted me to to, to, their, to their work. Um, it's it's really what we can draw from this work, which was um, assembled really by um, a, a French scholar called Robert Amadou, um, and termed the, the lessons of Leon. He he pulled all these manuscripts together that were written by these guys, and they were based in Lyon for a certain period of time in France in the late 18th century. And he pulled this information together around about 20 odd years ago. And, um, and it's been available in, in French. And the material discusses um, um, certain theurgical workings. It talks about um, the various meetings they're having. But it also contains something that's of general use and benefit to anyone on a spiritual quest which is um, material about the nature of man and why we're here and why does evil exist and what do we do to to break away from it. So that's what attracted me to the material. That's what attracted me to these people and this enigmatic character that's behind all of this, who doesn't contribute anything to the lessons directly, but he is the, the founder of their order. And that's uh, Don Martinez de Mesquale. OK, so Pasquale is this character who is corresponding with them, giving them directions. He dies actually in Haiti uh, partway through. Um, so uh, from an historical point of view, um, these 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 three or four men that contribute to this material, um, they don't even know he's died for some time. And although it never gets mentioned, you can you can discern within their writing this great sense of loss, actually, that their director um, has is, is no more, at least in this world. So, um, yeah, that that that's the reason for doing it. And the nature of the, of the uh, material really is comprised of um, notes and lectures and things of that nature, catechisms as well. That have been collected together and they were collected get together by that scholar that great scholar and um i tried to to obtain an english copy i couldn't it was in french so i thought what the heck let's um, let's get this down in english and uh, and since that point i've been trying to 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 do that really as much for my benefit as anyone else's actually yeah. And uh, again, uh, I'm always asking you big questions, asking all the guests big questions. That could be a mini series. That could take hours. But uh, we have done some, some previous shows on, on the Martinist tradition and some of the personalities involved. So I'll, I'll link those up so, so people can have some context if they're curious. But, but you mentioned this, this Pasquale character. And uh, if you could tell us a little bit more about him, even though he's, he's, he's a bit of a mystery, I, I think. Or, or maybe he's not, but he's always been a bit of a mystery to me when, I, when I've tried to research him. So if you can tell yeah. us, uh, you know, a, a little bit of a bio or a little bit about this, this, this curious and uh, fascinating and 
a very uh, great personality. It, it, indeed. Um, okay. I mean, the, the part one of the problems with um, researching Pasquale or, or, or anything about the original Elo Cohen, the the true order of the Elo Cohen. Um, is that everyone, everybody is an expert on the subject. It's a bit like talking about um, a, a great saint or something like that. So what I offer is really um, essentially my view, my, what I f find at the moment, and that may be different in the future, and it's different now from how it was a few years ago when I started out on the Lessons of Leon. Now I'm working on another book actually uh, by one of his adepts. Um, now, as a result of that, I have found out more information about Pasquale than I knew previously, or at least it potentially is um, about Pasquale. What I believe is that he um, was either himself or his father was um, was originally Jewish, uh, Portuguese Jew. There was about a hundred or more families living in um, Bordeaux, which is where he was based at the time of, of his birth. They were all um, affluent traders. They lived around the port area. There's a record um, that, that I found um, in the um, Grand Lodge library here that refers actually to uh, Martinez de Pasquale um, being um, initiated into an order in the Dublin Lodge. Oh, wow. Now, quite, I know. And we also, he's referred to in that document as a Jewish member. Yeah. Now, his father, of course, was also Martinez de Pasquale. Both fought in the military. They were closely aligned with the uh, Catholic Stuart cause. Yes. And um, there was peace between England and France after, I think it was 1763 from memory, around that sort of time. And Pasquale's regiment, this is the Pasquale's regiment was um, shipped back from San Domingo, Haiti, uh, back to Bordeaux. So any point thereafter, he could well have appeared in Dublin. And it's not so strange because, as I've researched, trade between uh, Bordeaux and Dublin and London and all sorts of other cities was very significant. And um, Dublin imported a lot of, um, of French wine, for instance, that was a particularly high sort of material that was brought in. So given what we know already about Pasquale's business interests or rather his family's interests in what was going on in, in Haiti, Saint-Domingue, okay, that's why he went over there. He wrote saying he's got family business over there um, and also his other cousins and so on um, were, were involved like the Casas and so on over in Haiti, um, it's quite likely actually that he may well have been the Martinez de Mesquale that's mentioned in in, in this um, now extinct Dublin Lodge as a member. If it's true, then he was originally Jewish. Um, I, he did convert, so there can be no doubt of that. Um, there's the certificate of Catholicism, which people have argued was relating really essentially to some sort of business he may have needed to be involved in or, or perhaps to establish um, his um, uh, ability to have his son christened in, in the church. Uh, he, well, but he had two sons, one died young. So that was important to him, actually. Yeah. Um, for all sorts of reasons, he, you know, his surviving son being nominated as the uh, replacement great sovereign, for instance, and that never happened. Um, so, yes, um, he converts. We know that as well from the writing and the material that it is very Christian. It's a Christian. Christian. But here's the thing about it, of course. He Christianizes the grimoire, right? OK, yeah. you know about this. So yeah. um, this particular grimoire that he, he Christianizes, well, that's ma that's material and access to material and his knowledge of the Kabbalah as well and things like that. Uh, and indeed, his deep knowledge of, of the uh, Pentateuch, the Torah, we know that from his treatise and reintegration, it all points to an original Jewish provenance. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I actually do have a, uh, maybe we'll talk about that a little bit more, but you basically covered it because I actually have it in my in, in my questions. That it, for me, it's it's indisputable that, that either he or his father is, is, is Jewish and perhaps connected to a Kabbalist extreme of, of Judaism, which is not, which is definitely not unheard of, particularly in Portugal, particularly in these areas. And uh, the, 
the Freemasonic lodges that had sort of connections to the royal sorts, to the Jacobins, were were known for being more accepting of, of Jewish people. And actually were known to be more, more orientated towards uh, esotericism, which may sound strange because yes. this was the Catholic cause and, you know, James II really didn't yeah. like uh, uh, the, the sort of uh, esoteric oogie boogie, but for, for a whole lot of reasons, uh, the, uh, the Royal Stewards and, and the Lodge just sort of behind their cause are a really important link in sort of decimating, uh, decimating um, uh, moving esoteric knowledge around Europe. So I, I, yeah, I really like that because it's a concept with French masonry, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 And uh, my last name's Stuart, and there's there's ancient, uh, uh, but there, we, we have family legends about be re being related to the royal stewards, but but we're not. You know, we were we were shepherds and you know bog people. But uh, <laughs> I, I like the legend of the water. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, okay, but uh, so there's kind of three other personalities, three other men involved with this, this collection, and we have talked about some of them on the show before, but again, just kind of a quick sketch for people on familiar. Uh, the big one, uh, Louis Claude de Saint Martin. He he appears in these letters. He appears in these documents. What's what's his deal? What's his connection to to the lessons of Lyon? Well, Saint Martin um, was originally was well, a minor nobleman. Um, I believe uh, Pasquale was in the Portuguese context, at least he inherited that. San Martin, minor French nobility, um, was also a cavalry officer at the time, and he met uh, Martinez that way, and um, eventually becomes his um, secretary. And um, he he moves to move he moves to Lyon to move into um, Villamuse's um, house, essentially for esoteric or spiritual training. Um, they had all the time in the world, I suppose, and if they're not on um, military activity, these gentry could probably um, certainly do that. And they may have received papers to 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 go back to barracks if there was anything. But this was a time of peace um, for, for, for some time anyway, at least after 1763, uh, 65, around that sort of time until the time of the um, the French participation in the American Revolution. But that was too late for Pasquale. He was already dead at that point. So Saint Martin moves in with, um, he is initiated by Pasquale, moves in with um, Villamuse, who's a Lyon silk merchant. Villamuse has all sorts of contacts and connections, including correspondence with um, the Comte de Saint Germain. Okay, so he, he's, he's a bit of a polymath, is Villamuse. And um, the other fellow, um, um, daughter Eve, uh, Jean Jacques Dor um, Daughter Eve. Not a lot is known about him. I mean, there's there's some people suggest that he might be a Protestant. Mm -hmm. um, I would have thought that unlikely, actually, from what I've read around the Catholic Elu Cohen. Um, but he may have been one originally. I mean, because Martinez himself converts from Judaism, so the jump from um, say being a Huguenot to a Catholic is somewhat less. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, the okay, so you mentioned the Elu Cohen, uh, big topics, but aren't they all? Can you give us a, a little sketch of of this group and what they were trying to do? And and you mentioned theurgy or or theurgy. You, we've actually talked on air how how nice it would be if we were gentry and we could just do do stuff like this all the time, right? Like like these fortunate people. Uh, and I'm like, you know, if only I could cast a a magic spell so I could win the lottery. But that's that's very different from theurgy, right? So could, could you tell us a little bit about theurgy and, and what the Alo Cohen were were up to, what they were trying to to achieve? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a big, it's a huge question and, and really um, a topic in and, in and of itself. But essentially, it comes down to their cosmogony about their their perception of the reality of, of the creation um, and and what and the world as it is and how it came about and what we need to do in order to a reconcile ourselves with God. Um, and then there's the regeneration aspect of it. Okay, that's the process of um of reintegrating with god and the reintegration itself is the culmination of that process where we return to the being that we originally were in unity with god now um pasquale taught that there are many ways and means of doing it but one of the best ways is to actually try and control and subjugate the forces of, of evil that are all around us 
because the idea is that all our thoughts and actions are actually influenced by an evil intellect. OK, so in that sense, we don't have complete free will. Um, we, we, well, we have free will, but our choice is limited because our thoughts and actions are influenced by these evil entities, which comes about because Adam, a great super angel, splinters into 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 many billions of pieces and um, is integrated into material matter in, in the universe. And Adam and, and Lucifer, they get together, they make the earth as it is and, and create. But man is trapped in the material body, this material form. And Lucifer, according to Elo Cohen, who becomes Satan. So he, he degenerates even further from the once lofty spiritual light and being that he was as well. Um, believes himself equal to God and um, therefore then influences and subjugates man well man was always intended to to be in charge of of him and to reconcile him back to God to put an end to evil and to wrap up material existence that's why time exists there's a beginning and an end so there's this sentence really that man has to serve as does Lucifer and the fallen angels well one way of controlling this, of course, is to um, evoke and then banish evil um, beings from within our presence. And that helps yourself. It clarifies the mind. It enables um, good intellects like angels and saints and, and so on and so forth to influence your thoughts instead. And this restoration and regeneration can begin. And it also helps um, ultimately society, wider society, in general so it's a it's a purposeful thing it's a means to an end it is not an end to a means as is so often the case with practitioners of these things and Pasquale is quite strict about the length of time that people can participate in these actions so he's very strict in his directions he's very strict in trying to protect these individual men who are essentially therefore exorcists um you know you have to improve yourself before you can go out and help others that's the basis of it but the idea really is to clean up everything and to get humanity moving and reconciled and regenerated and ultimately um reintegrated so it can get on with its business of bringing back uh the fallen um luciferic entities so yeah it's very millenarian um it, it, it is um, very much about the spiritual warfare between the forces of good and evil and so on and so forth. And the central figure, of course, in all of this is, is Christ, the repairer, uh, without whose incarnation and without whose sacrifice, there would never have been a portal possible enabling God's grace to come through into man and enabling him therefore to to regenerate and recoup these powers that he needs so um essentially john i don't know if that's any good as a summary excellent excellent an amazing oh, summary actually because it's right very very difficult things to to get into an elevator speech so um and, and you know maybe michael this is something i have to work on uh because maybe i'm self-conscious talking about you know angels and powers and supernaturalism even though you know here i am on a, on a religious podcast uh, a, a deacon in a, in a gnostic church but but i think people listening to this can understand the kind of union psychological angles of it as well and, and that's what you also said this this grappling with with evil with negativity it's also an internal thing right when you're when you're talking about the the exorcisms when you're talking about the good living when you're talking about these these ceremonies and these prayers it, it really is a uh, uh a lot of it is is an interior interior journey is, am i right in that reading yeah, it, it, well, it is essentially interior to begin with. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, what you can't have is imbalance. So if you were simply to to take the quietest approach, lock yourself in a room, um, well, you know, that, that wouldn't do your fellow human beings a lot of good. 
Um, so really, you've got to do something with that. And the whole idea, of course, of binding evil spirits or whatever it is, um, is, is to free up other people to get their free will, their, 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 their choice and their minds cleared in order to begin to discern God. Now, um, if, if someone chooses not to believe in the spirit, angels, demons or the divinity, whatever the case may be, fine, because I think these sorts of things are good um, in, a, in a sort of almost... Um, 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 cognitive behavioural therapy way, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah, truly. <laughs> in, in transforming individuals, a bit like meditation is useful for people. Um, you know, re re regardless, actually, I suspect. But of course, the, the reality is, if you do believe in the existence of evil, which the Elu Cohen did, then um, it could take very great advantage of uh, disbelief and ego and hubris, perhaps. Um, so these things are always stamped down upon by Pasquale, who um, exhorts all of his adepts to act in a very chivalrous way. So it, it, it's uh, an order, a chivalrous order as well as, as much as anything else. And the reason for that is that virtue is the key. Yeah. So it's a power, actually. It's, it's a way to, um, by doing good unto others and do unto your neighbour as yourself, all these things were taught, and I personally fail miserably at i don't know about you but sure if do. we were to if we were to do these things then it actually um if you like um forces out negativity it, it would dissipate yeah yeah i i and i'm kind of hammering this, this point home but like a, a holiness kind of pervades these documents you, you can feel it when you're reading it and i think sometimes people turn to esoteric traditions because they want to become wizards or they want to become enlightened or they want to discover uh the, a mystery that nobody else knows they want to become they want to become special but that that's not really what these workings are about right that, that's not really what these these documents are about they they really yeah there's just uh, an aura of holiness uh, about them as well as this this whole tradition uh would, would you would you agree with that yeah i mean it's underpinned by a deep sense of of uh, christian faith yeah um like i say the centrality of the repairer and um these are these are catholic mystics uh, um it's a catholic order essentially that's the root of 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 martinism anyway in its original form i mean it's evolved on in different ways i suppose but in its original form the Cohen are a catholic order yeah. And um, they they have a, well, Pasquale, uh, maybe it's the enthusiasm of the convert, I don't know. And of course, he may not be. But assuming he is, his interest in things like the liturgical hours and following very strict um, prayer cycles, they're, followed, they're based around the Catholic prayer cycles, monastic prayer cycles. Um, so th they talk about this sometimes in 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 the correspond well, in the notes I should say in the lessons of Leon, um, and you know they do find it difficult. It is hard, but it is a discipline, and it's quite necessary. So the spirituality, that sense of um, prayerfulness that you, one might develop if one wants to pray at least three or four times a day, following monastic hours as a minimum, I think then um, that would definitely rub off. And they are talking about this. But also, John, uh, it was a generation that was more familiar with this sort of lifestyle yeah. and yeah, belief system than we are now. Yeah, exactly. It would have. It was a very, very Catholic world and a very Catholic place. So, uh, yeah. a lot of this would have been uh, second nature, even if they are taking it up a step. Well, we we spent some time really talking about the Catholicism of of the material that's in these letters and some of the materials in Pascali. But but coming back to the Judaism, like I really liked how you how you mentioned there's a. Uh, there's sort of traces of, uh, of temple theology in Pasquale's thought, because when you read both, both these documents and some of the other documents in, in the Elo Cohen tradition, particularly the, the, the Rokra uh, initiation, uh, which I've only read uh, the English reconstruction by by Father Matthew Ravenat. It, it almost reads like a, like a primitive Judaism, like a like something. It feel like it reads like something from the first temple. It's 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 very, um, uh, you know, if I was if I was better trained or an anthropologist or a better history of religion, I, I would love to compare it to to earlier thought. But it, it's uh, and I mean primitive in in the best ways possible. Yeah. Um, so yeah. there's we talked a lot about the Catholic 
Catholicism, but it, they really use the Old Testament in lots of interesting ways, like in, in these documents and in others. But it, it's 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 allegorical, extremely allegorical, allegorical. And I think sometimes in 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 these Christian based traditions or in some of the Gnostic traditions or uh, in in the modern world, you, people kind of disparage the Old Testament in a way that almost borders on anti Semitism. So can you can you talk a, a little bit about their their use of uh, you know I shouldn't be saying Old Testament at all the the Hebrew Bible the Pentateuch but but how they really personalize it how they really connect it to 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 the initiate's life. Okay, well, what Pasquale is trying to uh, suggest to his adepts is that um, this isn't new, what I'm doing. It's actually very old. It's the original religion, if you like, that I'm interested in. The religion of Adam. What was Adam doing? What was Adam supposed to have been doing? Well, he talks about this at length, does he not, in his uh, exposition of Genesis, in his treatise on reintegration. So that's the starting point, really, to understanding all of this, because he's saying, look, um, you know, evil got in the way and confused man and man's pride led to his fall into nature. But now we've got to try and find our way back. And the best metaphor for that or allegory, of course, is, is the temple and the building. Now, here's the thing. I mean, he probably is from a Levitical family. OK, so they are the the, the, the priesthood. So the the. Uh, magic that um, arose after the fall of the temple it was existed before it but the it wasn't sanctioned but the magic that existed after the fall of the temple was essentially the levites preserving um original temple worship yeah okay right yeah and this carries on all the way through which is why the 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 the, the magical grimoires not the particularly sinister or nasty ones but the the sort of the the, the very sort of um um, you, more useful ones perhaps um they, they they come from judaism and that's they're sort of then used by christians and christianized and that's what pasquale is doing but he's all about this um the idea because if you think about the original temple um you've got the shekinah present there you see yeah. okay and the shekinah would provide have provided in his mind that's the way he would think about it a shield over the thought processes of those that were close to it okay so therefore with this envelope around the the priests um, approaching the holy of holies they would have been freed from evil influence and able perhaps to do something towards um, replicating the original religion of adam as fully as possible which is essentially what the temple was all about was to have god present as adam as he was present with adam in the garden garden of eden okay so why the temple was built there on mount moriah in the first place by tradition it's the site of the garden of eden and the habitation of god as well as of adam and eve okay so that's an allegory of course for for another world or dimension that we, we were occupying before this one but it's a portal nonetheless so the temple's gone um the levites are still there um the the the, the rites the symbols the um uh, the magic um is still there but it's evolving and of course pasquale converts to christianity he recognizes in christ the repairer and uh, the the portal of grace that people need in order to um essentially uh, redeem themselves or transform themselves so it's something you have to do in response to christ that rather than just relying oh great i've been forgiven it's something you've got to do back so uh, it's the two-way th process so pasquale takes that and he says well look okay what's the what's the best metaphor i can use it's the one of the temple rebuilding the temple it fits in with freemasonry which is why he recruits um, exclusively from within it it fits in with his own tradition and his own understanding of the of the Torah and and, and Levitical processes that, that have gone on in the diaspora since the fall of the temple and it also fits in with the Catholicity as well because ultimately at the end of the day Christianity um, it regards itself as the fulfillment of the old not as a brand new religion it's 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 a fulfillment the capstone if you like
Yeah. So it all ties in. Yeah. It all ties in. Um, and yes, that that is principally why there is a lot of talk about um, rebuilding the temple um, in the lessons of Leon for that reason, because we are each and every one of us a particular temple and temples are what? They're places of worship and they're places where gods reside. Exactly. And I, th I think people can get that metaphor right away and how important it is to have an appropriate temple for a god to reside within. Um, a, something else, maybe, maybe another misconception. Uh, there, there's, there's sort of an idea. OK, so, so you mentioned uh, the, the, uh, the, the chivalric, the, the chivalrous uh, aspects of the order, the, the mill, 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 uh, man, my pronunciation, the making the world better uh, aspects. Now, there's the Rosicrucian tradition, right? And the Rosicrucian tradition has a, a strong emphasis on, on reform, on making society better. And, and people have said, you know, for Pasquale in the original Elu Cohen, there's no connection to anything Rosicrucian. It's, it's all a mistake that comes out from this, this Rocra uh, uh, ceremony, which means Red Cross. But, but isn't there references to being a true Rosicrucian, to Rosicrucianism in, in some of this material? Well, the Rocra is the highest degree yeah. in, in the Elu Cohen. So um, he, he definitely was influenced by uh, Rosicrucianism. I mean, um, for instance, um, one of his mentors when he was much younger was Swedenborg. OK, um, so that alone. And then, of course, you've got this mysterious uncle. And I think that Pasquale refers uh, in his letters at one point to, to having had a Rosicrucian uh, provenance at one point or another. And the whole point of Rosicrucianism anyway is to try and establish utopia here on earth and um and that's exactly well he's not trying to do that. He's trying to get us back to where we came from but it it fits in it ties in and it does influence freemasonry yeah. so rosicrucianism infiltrates the masonic guilds it comes in that way as well and of course he recruits exclusively from from freemasonry as i've said so yeah and the highest grade is is rosicrucian yeah now, uh, I'm going to ask you to, to speculate, and uh, I don't want to get into any esoteric politics. People people love their squabbles. They they love their politics. But I'm quite fond of, of Papus's 1890 or so uh, revival or construction of what he calls marginism. Well, you would. You're a deacon in the Gnostic Church. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So I, I, you know, I, I really, I really love that tradition. And uh, for people at home, this is, you know, this, this is well after, uh, almost a hundred years after uh, the, the period that we're talking about now. So the, the, this great uh, mystic Papus, uh, that that's his, that's his esoteric name. His, uh, his uh, uh, you know, he puts together uh, an order that draws from both uh, uh, Pasquale and Louis Claude de Saint Martin, and he calls it. We got two Martins, so he calls it Martinism. But the strange thing is in in the early degrees um, where, where you're working through materials, you're, you're hearing lectures. It, in many of these orders that descend from Papus's 1890 revival, there's not a lot of content from Pasquale or Louis Claude de Saint Martin or Villermos in those those early degrees, those those um, those foundational degrees. And of course, it could vary from order to order, but many of them. Yeah. Why do you think? Why do you think that is? It, it seems kind of weird. And do you think like a book like this might might help remedy that? Well, the idea behind the book is that it, it would certainly do that because I think Martinez de Pasquale and San Martin and the Elo Cuin need to be recognised for what they were, which is Catholic mystics. Now, I've, I don't know why um, Pappas would have redacted it or, or later on Amberlane, of course, moving even further along. Um, other than perhaps the material wasn't there or there was an agenda. But there is no continuity between the early Co Elo Cohen and the orders that exist now. Yeah. Um, and yes, I, it, it is. Yeah, I don't really know how to answer that other than it is what it is. It's, it is what it is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Pappas, yeah. I mean, and and Anne Boleyn, of course, they 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 had their own agendas, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and but he did have access to this stuff, though. Yeah. Pappas, we know that because most of it was in his private collection and then ended up at the um, um, library in Leon. you see. Yeah. The, the bulk of this is from him. 
Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's that's also why why I find it so puzzling. So, mm. but uh, but uh, thank you, thank you for uh, clarifying and having a, a little bit of speculation. Well, well, if you want a parallel, you could yeah. say, well, okay, what did Marcion do to the New Testament? Yeah, yeah, right? exactly, right, exactly. He strips yeah. it down to the Gospel of John, essentially. Well, maybe these guys were doing the same thing with the material they had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. We, we can't always expect people from the past to live up to the standards of today. But, you know, I noticed references in, in this material to men and women being equal, which uh, some positive, especially for the time, comments about uh, the Jews, Jewish people. Uh, there's the possible inclusion of this of this Protestant, uh, the, the Hataviv. Uh, and now the Elo Cohen was was rich people. But uh, do, do you see inclusion? This, this inclusion is perhaps an expression wow. of their values? You know, there are some anti-Semitic remarks in, 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 in the lessons of Leon, and there's also yeah. um, remarks um, regarding slaves, and, and though not many, yeah. they are yeah. men of their time. They are French, yeah. ancien regime people. Um, yes, the 18th century is called the century of lights. It's the birth of, essentially, the birth of, of the modern world, um, and people are making great progress and strides um in science and in um trying to improve conditions and the industrial revolution all sorts of things that were happening but they are men of their time for men of their time they are enlightened and inclusive yeah. um i i would certainly say i mean their founder um is from a um a, a broader background for instance and considering that they're from that the the adepts that he recruited are essentially aristocracy by and large yes there's clergymen there's fournier in there and and, and whatnot um and there's the odd reference to someone even higher up in the church but um by and large you know given all of that they are actually very um open open-minded i think aren't they or at least not not open-minded but um um tolerant yes yeah, yeah. And, and more so than what you would expect for their their social class and the time but again just just like i preface that question that question we, we can't hold uh people from the past up to the standards of, of today it was a very different world very well, different you can't. worldviews you can't and particularly if they if there's a strong bordeaux element in there which there is it's, it's a huge bordeaux element in there Squally's hometown and, and Fournier's hometown, for instance, um, and the military members were recruited in Bordeaux, such as Saint Martin, and so on. Well, Bordeaux was the centre of the um, of the um, uh, triangular slave trade. Yeah. It was probably the largest slave trading port in the world. Okay, so although France didn't have like England, they didn't have slavery in France. It didn't stop it participating in a massive way elsewhere in its colonies. Yeah. Okay. So the comments, the remarks that are in the lessons of Leon, there's not many, but it's San Matan actually of all people. Um, but um, those sorts of things you've just got to take within the context of the time. And, and you would know with certainty in your heart, with certainty that were he here today, he would be mortified that he'd Absolutely. ever witnessed such things. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we, t we talked about Pasquale's cosmology in this episode, and you kind of take us through it in, in the Brazen Serpent episodes, which we'll link up. But, but something we didn't talk about, and again, very complicated, is The Thing. And uh, I'm not talking about the 1981 John Carpenter movie. Uh, Le Chose is, is, is what they call it. Or, or yeah. the remake, yeah. Um, the, the, uh, it's, a very, it's a very strange uh, term. Uh, it's a very shocking term in many ways. The, the thing, the shows. What, what, I what is the thing? And how do, what, what, what role does it play in the cosmology? And, and why is it called the thing? Well, if I knew what it was, it wouldn't be called the thing. Yeah. And, of course, the idea behind the thing is you're not supposed to know its name. Because yeah. if you know the name of something, you can, of course, command and the thing isn't about that. Now, if you go back to what I was saying about creating an envelope around our thoughts and minds to enable um, God to begin to communicate with us, or at least maybe not directly, at least with loftier, higher beings, then you need something that is very superior spiritually that can actually do that. And the idea of the shows, the thing, 
um, is, is essentially to a um, give it a, a generic name as so as not to identify and particularly to outsiders. OK. And thirdly, the thing is clearly a very lofty spiritual being indeed who is invoked if, if successfully and can act alongside the, um, the, the exorcist in expelling evil and also in protecting the exorcist from evil in order that reconciliation, regeneration and reintegration can, can happen. So you need to do that. We are not capable of doing it on our own. That's the point of the incarnation of God in the form of the repairer. That's the point of the role of the Holy Spirit since Pentecost. And the thing is a part and parcel of that. A.E. Waite suggested that the thing may have been the presence, but not the per person of Christ himself. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. But I couldn't think of a loftier being to actually involve. However, it could be lower down. And indeed, John, you probably know much more about this than I do. <laughs> well, I wish uh, I wish I do more and uh, I wish I wish I could beat the thing for myself. But uh, this is probably a good point to, to, to start wrapping up. Um, it, as always, it's been a, an awesome discussion. And I'm really excited to hear that you're working on a new book because I know a podcast that you can come on to talk about it. Yeah. And um, everybody, it's The Lessons of Lyon by, by M.R. Osborne. Michael R. Osborne. You can buy it on Amazon. You can get it, you know, online, where mostly where you can get books, right? Wherever you get your books, uh, order a copy of this. If, if you like this show, chances are you're going to like this and Michael's other books. Um, Michael, thanks again. Yeah, thank you. Just one one remark, actually. Um, at the back of the lessons of Leon, mm -hmm. it's not mentioned in the title, but it is on the back of the cover and in the marketing. Um, I've included... Um, some 30 or so letters um, from and to Martinez de Pasquale. And they range from the period of 1767 through to um, the early 1770s. OK, now um, they those letters are um, in the, the public domain, actually. So they've been produced in English, not by me, but by somebody else in the past. But they're in this book in their entirety. So I just mentioned that yeah. uh, if you want to um, have a look at them, they're in the back. So it's not just the lessons of Leon, but also there's this bonus material that I thought was important to put at the back. Perfect. To the actual perfect. words of Pasquale. No, that, that's really awesome. And, and, and folks, you're getting you're getting a two for one with this edition. So, almost. Yeah, almost. Yeah. So so definitely check that out. OK, thanks again. And thanks, everybody at home for watching. And uh, oh, I almost forgot our commercial for, for our Patreon, which is uh, how you can support the show. You can sign up for as little for a dollar per piece a month with uh, automatic contributions over patreon.com slash Gnostic or paypal.me slash Gnostic for one time donations. We understand if you can't help us out financially, just just as we've mentioned, I, I haven't figured out that magic ritual to to win the lottery yet and, and chances are you haven't either so you can just tell people about the show or share it on your social media uh like and subscribe all that good stuff helps us out a lot okay thanks again michael bye-bye thank you